Uh, before I get ready to preach, I do just want to uh, publicly acknowledge Lori. It's good to have you and the crew back with us this morning. Uh, can we just praise the Lord for Lori and the kids being here with us today, y'all? And then Pastor Stewart, brother, uh, thank you. Uh, good to have you and, and Jen here with us as well. I know that all of us that were at the funeral yesterday were blessed by that beautiful eulogy that you delivered in honor of Jimmy. So glad to have y'all with us. I uh, hope that the, the gathering is going to be a blessing to y'all. And I also just want to kind of acknowledge and celebrate y'all church. Um, yesterday at Jimmy's funeral, there were so many people that uh, came up and mentioned how they heard about this season of suffering that we've been in with uh, the different trials and stuff that we've walked through as a church. And it's just been encouraged by y'all, uh, encouraged by your steadfastness and faith, encouraged by you loving one another. So I think y'all should give your, yourselves a hand as well for walking through trials in a way that brings the Lord glory. There is a way to glorify God amidst trial. And I'm talking a little bit about that today uh, in this sermon. So Psalm 126, if you got it, would you stand with me and honor the Lord and his word as we prepare to read it together. Psalm 126. Starting at verse 1, God's word says, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter then, and our tongues with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord had done great things for us, and we were joyful. At that point, church, why don't everybody just do this with me and say, you're going to know why we do that here in a little bit. Verse 4 says, Restore our fortunes, Lord, like water courses in the Negev. That those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. The one goes along weeping, carrying the bag of seed. He will surely come back with shouts of joy, carrying his sheaves. I can take your seats. This is God's word. From it, I want to preach with this thought in mind. Looking back to go forward looking back to go forward. God, we thank you for your word and for how instructive it is for us in the many different seasons that we'll face in life. God, we thank you that this morning you have for us in your word instructions about how we can lament with hope, how we can look backwards and trust that in the same way you've restored us in times past, you have the power to restore us in times future. God, we thank you for what your word teaches us about how to handle our tears, that our crying isn't wasted. We thank you that your word teaches us what you do with our tears, God. And so, God, I pray and ask that all of this would be a source of encouragement, uh, reassurance, and a balm to your people as we study your word together. And, God, I pray that you give me grace as a preacher this morning. Uh, would you help me to be clear in my own thoughts, uh, clear in my speech, and to preach with great conviction of heart? You know my dependence upon you, God. And so I pray and ask that you would do what only you can and overcome my human insufficiency so that your word might go forth and supernaturally pierce the hearts of your people. God, I pray that if there be anyone among us who doesn't know you, is not trusting you, that they would see you as the compassionate, trustworthy God that you are this morning. I pray and ask that their hearts would be pierced by this truth, and they repent, forsake all, and seek to follow you in Christ Jesus. Give us all grace toward this end, Father. It's for your glory, with dependence upon your spirit, and in the name of your son, that I both pray and preach. Amen. When was the last time you took a stroll down memory lane? When was the last time you took a stroll down old memory lane? And I do intend to be somewhat suggestive when I ask this question, by the way. Uh, do you remember the last time that you picked up an old photo album or your high school yearbook? and pause with it, simply to remember. And can you recall how that time of remembering made you feel? I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I'm finding that the more life I live, the, the longer memory lane tends to be. I'm finding that the more experiences I have, the fuller memory lane tends to be. And I'm discovering, friends, that memory lane, as we all call it, is a road that grows and lengthens and fills over time. It gets to be longer, and there's more life to look back over, and it gets to be fuller, and there are more experiences along the way. And I'm also learning that it's a road that becomes more accessible the longer you live. There are more own ramps, different kinds of triggers and associations throughout life that may bring different memories to mind. 
I mean, we live in a day and age now where you don't even have to go looking for them, right? Like y'all know how Facebook is. Uh, Facebook brings memories to the palms of your hands, and, and it might send you down a kind of involuntary stroll of memory lane. And I think, friends, that if we'll allow them to be, these strolls can oftentimes be good for us. I want to suggest to us this morning that for the people of God in particular, the act of remembering can prove to be good for our hearts and souls. I want to suggest that there's something about pausing to look back that can oftentimes be good for carrying us forward. That seems to be the tenor, the tone, and the theme of Psalm 126. Uh, this psalm helps to teach us, friends, that the act of remembering God-given joys and restoration from the past can actually fuel hope and even embolden our prayers for joys and restoration of the future. It seems that that's just, this is what we find the people of God doing in Psalm 126. This psalm seems to provide somewhat of a peek into this kind of a reflective, I remember when conversation that the people of God are having amongst themselves. Uh, many scholars believe that the psalm was written to reflect on the time of God rescuing his people from exile and captivity to Babylon. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had captured and oppressed God's people. Uh, naturally, they longed to be free and rescued from this oppression. God eventually did free and restore them. And there's a high likelihood that it's this liberation, that is that restoration that's in mind when the author writes Psalm 126. We can't be sure about it because the psalm doesn't say it explicitly. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Because this psalm, friends, can actually be applied to any restoration that God provides for his people. Because what we do know from what the psalmist writes is that they are remembering how they needed to be restored and how God indeed restored them. And what we do know from what the psalmist writes is that they are currently needing to be restored, and so they're trusting God to restore them. And so what we can kind of draw out of what the psalmist writes is that when the people of God, friends, when we, the people of God, are in need of restoration, the people of God pause to remember when God has given restoration. And so whatever it is that you're having to trust God to restore to you today, whether it be the restoration of joy, uh, the restoration of peace, the restoration of righteousness, or hope, or holiness, or happiness, or holiness, whatever it may be that you're having to trust God for this morning. One thing that might be helpful for you along this journey of trusting him is the act of remembering when. God's people are a people of remembering when. And so the psalmist says in verse 1, I remember when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. When he restored the fortunes of his people, when he pulled us out of Babylon and rightfully placed us back under the shadows of our own Mount Zion, when he placed us back in the cities of Judah and restored the fortunes of Jerusalem, the psalmist says, I remember that. And we were like those who dream. He says we were literally living the dream. The deliverance and restoration from God was so good that it was almost too good to be true. He's saying God's restoration of them brought such joy that they were in a delirium-like state of dreaminess. Now, can't you see the psalmist's church with a smile coming over his face as he remembers the goodness of God, with hope lifting his chin as he reflects on the goodness of God? This was a song that Ashley would have sang in a group. So can't you see or, or hear the joy in all the people's voices? They collectively remember the goodness of God. The people may be suffering right now, but there's a lightness in their suffering because they're remembering a time when God had rescued them and brought restoration to them amidst their past suffering. So can you see him, church? Can you see the people? They know that God is able to meet his people in suffering. They know that God is able to restore his people out of suffering, and so they remember those times with joy. He says their mouths were filled with laughter and their tongues with shouts of joy. It was a good, joyous time. You can almost see the psalmist in his own mind kind of reaching backwards to, to take hold of and grab that joy and pull it into the present time. He pulls it into the present time of his trials. And I want you to hear me when I say this to you, beloved. This is what pausing to remember when can do for you. Remembering when can give you joy amidst joylessness. It may not fix your situation immediately, but it will remind you that you serve a God who has the power to fix it if he so chooses. And it will remind you that you serve a God who has fixed problems and brought restoration in the past. And it will remind you, friends, that you serve a God who is neither unaware nor unempathetic toward the suffering you endure. I said this to y'all before, but I think it's worth saying again. Write down and keep records when you see the goodness of God in your life. And then when you need to see his goodness again, go back to those written records. Read what you, what you yourself wrote about how God was good to you in times of the past. 
It's important for us to live this way, beloved, not only for the sake of our own good, not only for the sake of our own trust in the Lord even, but it's important for us to live this way so that those around us can observe our trust in the Lord. Look at what the psalmist says at the end of verse 2. They said among the nations, those who observe God's activity among his people, they said among that group, the Lord has done great things for his people. And so the dreaminess and the joy of God's people when he restored them, it wasn't limited to only being witnessed by they themselves. They didn't limit it to just being, it wasn't limited to just being witnessed by one another. There were others, friends, who heard their shouting and saw their smiles. And the beauty that came from it is that those who observed it traced the source of it all past the people themselves back to the God who had restored them. Friends, God gets glory when we allow his restorative work to be seen in our lives. He's glorified when we live, letting his goodness be on display. I was recently looking at the story of a missionary who serves over in Italy. Uh, Reed Carr and his first wife, Kyra, they uh, initially went to Italy back in 2009. And so they get there, uh, they begin serving, uh, they're seeking to evangelize, church planting, faithfully seeking to be used by the Lord in their ministry. But they came home for the, uh, to the States for a furlough in 2015. And they'd been here for a while. Uh, they'd been enjoying reuniting with family and friends, what people do when they come home after a while. Then on the night before they were set to return to Italy, they were out driving, leaving some friend's house, headed back to Reed's parents' house, I think. And apparently the driver of an 18-wheeler had gotten out of his truck to check on something, but had failed to put the emergency brake down. The truck got away from him, it rolls down a hill, it crushes Reed and Kyra's vehicle as they go through an intersection, tragically killing Kyra upon impact. Now, this obviously threw Reed into a crisis that most of us can only imagine the severity of. And here's his wife, his best friend, the mother of his children, his ministry partner. And so naturally, he starts to question whether he should return to Italy and continue the ministry he started. But after prayer and seeking counsel, he returns. And the neighbors, you can't make this up, the neighbors who Reed and Kyra had been working years to share the gospel with eventually trusted Christ because of the way they saw God sustain and restore Reed's joy through this tragedy. Hear me say it again, friends. God is glorified when we allow his work of restoration to be seen in our lives. I don't even have to go back to Italy to grab an example for it, though. There's a number of you among us at Pioneer Church who's glorified the Lord by allowing his restoration to be seen through you. So carry on in his way, beloved. Remember your own joys from God's restoration and allow the world around you to witness it as well. Like You ain't got to be all pretty and, and peaceful in your suffering but you can be a living testimony of God's restorative and sustaining power when you suffer. And then when you do this, friend, you may find that the world will observe about you how God has, been, how God has done great things for his people. And you may find that from your joy or from your laughter or from your exuberance, from whatever trusting God and trial looks like for you, the nations, the observers around you may join in pointing to God's goodness with you. They may join in and add to the buzz and bustle about God's goodness among his people. The nations in the passage, those who likely had no relational knowledge of God, they were able to look at God's people and say, whoever their God is, he has done great things for his people. And God had done great things for his people. And so the people themselves, they take a moment in verse 3, and they themselves sit back, and they themselves remark at how God had been good to them. And they themselves remember that from their own vantage point at this point in verse 3, that the Lord had done great things for them. And because of it, we see here again where it says, they were joyful. I don't know about y'all, but when I read this song, I can almost feel a change of pace and a change of tone from the top of verse 2 down to the bottom of verse 3. In verse 2, you've got the buzz and bustle about God's goodness. The people are remembering the laughter that filled their mouths, the shouts that leaped from their tongues. They're recalling how surrounding nations heard their laughter and shouts and started to speak of God's great work among them. They're remembering the great things that God had done for them, how joyfully loud it was to relish in the restoration that God had granted. But then you pull into verse 3, and as we attempt to interpret the emotion of this passage or to read from the white space what isn't filled up by words, what I believe we find, friends, is that the people move from the buzz and bustle of remembrance into a, a sigh of hope for what used to be. We were joyful, the text says. 
I read from this that the people sigh here because they see the contrast between their past days of actively being restored by God and their present days of desperately needing God's restoration right now. And so before they begin to pray for God's restoration again in verse 4, we get the sense that they, those who are familiar with orchestra and symphony performances, uh, performances have probably heard uh, of what's known as a farewell symphony. Uh, it's this unique performance that's kind of characterized by an orchestra shrinking in size and, and, and going down in volume as the performance goes on. And so whereas many performances build toward a crescendo and they seek to increase in volume and intensity, a farewell symphony does the opposite and gradually decreases until the performance comes to a close. And the performance is actually rooted in a story, a true story, about an 18th century prince who loved symphonies. And so the prince hired out and built a symphony made up of some of the best instrumentalists to be found. He had them report to his palace and stay there for the entire summer. They practice and perform and practice and perform. The prince worked the performance to the bone. And so eventually, they started to miss their families. They wanted to go home. But the prince wasn't yet satisfied. Well, the conductor who led the symphony, he got wind of the people being fatigued. He started to feel bad for the performers. And so he wrote a performance in which, at the end of each musical, musical section, one of the performers would stop playing, get up from their seats, snuff their candle out, and walk off the stage. They did this one by one until at the end of the performance, only the conductor himself and the concert master were left. And the conductor's hope was that the gradual decrease in sound would send a message to the prince and that he'd be able to feel and identify with the heaviness that the performers had been feeling as they were missing their families. Now, the hope was that the gradual decrease in sound and volume would carry a message that was as loud as when all the performers were present. And it worked. The message was received. The prince allowed the performers to go home, and we all learn a lesson about how a decrease in volume can sometimes send a message that is louder than it was with all the sound. And I got to tell you, beloved, as I studied the song this week, the implicit, the sigh that I sensed at the end of verse 3, it spoke as loudly to me as did the words around it. And the reason I bring it to your attention this morning is because I want you to know that as you live this life, seeing God's restoration in one moment and yet needing to see it again in the very next moment, as you live this life remembering what God did and still having to wait and hope for what God will do, as you live this life going back and forth between those two tensions, friends, there will be moments of silence and sighs, moments of waking up and finding that the loss has yet to be replaced, moments of waking up and ending a, or ending a phone call and, and it being news that's hard to swallow, Moments of the party coming to an end, and when company parts, you find yourself alone. Moments of walking to your car as you leave the doctor's office, and you've got to sit with this unfavorable report you just heard. Moments of leaving a gravesite and trying to settle into a new normal. There may be moments of slowness, of silence, sighs, decrease in volume between the restoration of yesterday and the desired restoration of tomorrow. But hear me say this, church, those moments can be good for you. The temptation for us can be to, to try to fill those moments with noise, to run from those moments, because it's in those moments that the pain and the heartache we feel from whatever restoration or joy we currently lack, it's in those moments that that pain is most heavily felt. Our pain is most palpable and, and most real and most in our face during those moments. So we may try to escape those moments, but, but here's why some of those moments can be good for you. Because, friends, it's in those moments of sighing and sitting in your sorrows that God climbs into your sorrows with you before lifting you to carry you out of them. Hear me on this, church. If you just went from sorrow to renewed joy without sitting in the sorrow, you wouldn't know the privilege of having God meet you in your sorrows and lift you into his arms and eventually walk you up out of a valley. And so as, he as hard and as heavy as those moments may be, they can be good for you because they often provide a unique meeting place for you and God. Those are often the places, church, where God meets you to lift you. And as he lifts you, and as he walks with you, you can start to take on a posture of confidence in God and courage to carry on. As you experience the Lord's lift and embrace out of those low places, you start to adopt language of hope about the future like the psalmist does in verse 4. That to be remembered is this God-given restoration of the past. And after he sits with his apparent need for restoration in the present, he starts to ask for it in boldness 
Restore our fortunes, Lord, like water courses in the Negev. The psalmist essentially asked God to renew to them what they lost in, in the same way that he was able to renew moisture in dry riverbeds. I'm going to unpack that and say a little bit more about it in just a minute. But first I want us to notice how the psalmist speaks to God in the imperative voice. I know what the imperative voice is, right? It's a tone of speech that a parent uses with a child, but that a child better not use with a parent. It's the tone of speech when someone is essentially making demands of someone. It's when you express requirements that need to be met. It's not a tone of voice that we would assume the people of God can use in conversation with God. And yet it is the tone that the psalmist uses here. And so we got to ask ourselves, church, what is it that makes the psalmist feel permitted, we should say, to use his tone of voice as he speaks to God? It's a great question. I'm so glad y'all are asking it in your silence this morning. And the answer to it is actually instructive for us. The psalmist can speak to God in his imperative voice because of what he just finished doing in the previous verses. In verses 1 through 3, he reflects on God's goodness. He remembers what God has done before. And then in verse 4, he makes an imperative petition. He, 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 he requests that God would do what he did before again. And so the reason the psalmist can speak to God in the imperative voice is because he isn't asking God to do anything that runs counter to God's character. He's expressing a requirement that is in line with God's character. He's just asking God to do now the same thing that God had already done before. And so he can speak to God in the imperative voice because the imperative request he makes is him calling on God to be what God himself has already shown himself to be. And so what does this mean for us in our prayer lives when we feel low and when we need restoration? I'll tell you what it means. It means we ought to strive in prayer to know God's faithful dependability so well that we bank on him doing what he says he will do. And it means we ought to strive in prayer to know God's unchanging person so well that we bank on him being who he's always been. We should strive to keep mental and heartfelt records of God's faithfulness and dependability and of his consistency and character and personhood. I imagine that's exactly what the psalmist is doing as he writes this song. Uh, He's remembering how God had said in Isaiah 14 how he would resettle his people in in their own land, how the captives would eventually become their captives. He's remembering how God said to them in Isaiah 44 that the cities of Judah would be rebuilt and the ruins of Jerusalem would be restored and that they indeed, and then they, they indeed were restored. He's remembering how God said in Isaiah 48 that the people of God would be free from Babylon, how they'd leave Babylon with shouts of joy and be redeemed as God's people. Or maybe he's remembering all that God said through Jeremiah's prophecy and how those prophecies came true. Maybe he's remembering when God said he'd restore their fortunes and gather them from the places to which they were banished or or how he rebuilt them to the point of their former time. Maybe he was remembering all of that and expecting that God would be as dependable for future restoration as he was for the restoration out of Babylon. I trust he's remembering all of that, church. Then I also trust he's remembering, he's reminding himself of the consistent person and character of God. Uh, This likely would have come to mind just by him referring to God as the Lord in his own Hebrew language. Uh, We we use the word or the phrase the Lord today, and we know we're talking about God when we say it. But the phrase doesn't always carry the appropriate amount of weight when we use it. But friends, in the psalmist's day, when he would have recalled in verse 1 that it was the Lord who had restored their fortunes, And then when he gets to verse 4 and he cries out that it be the Lord who would restore their fortunes again, just by using the name he uses to refer to God, the psalmist is remembering the consistent person and character of God. He's using the the Hebrew name Yahweh to refer to God. Now, it doesn't translate to say Yahweh in our English Bibles, but most of our Bibles probably have the word Lord written in all caps to indicate that Yahweh is the name being used. And this is important for us to note here because Yahweh is the personal name that God gave his people to call him by when he sent Moses to rescue them out of Egypt. Go read about it in Exodus chapter 3. It's God's personal name, and it carries profound meaning, such profound meaning that Moses and the people probably didn't know exactly how to respond when God introduced himself in this way. You see, most Hebrew names uh, tend to be a complete phrase and are often spoken in the past tense. Moses means drawn out. That's past tense. Joshua, God is salvation. That's a complete idea. Joseph, God will add, that's a complete idea. Seth, in the place of God, or, or, or in the place of, or God has replaced. That's a complete idea with a past tense memory. This is the way they understood names. And so when God told Moses that his name was Yahweh, which you see in your Bibles as the Lord in all caps, it carried a profound meaning, church. Because if y'all know what Yahweh translates to mean? I am. <laughs> that's it. That's all it means. 
I am is a present tense statement that only makes sense if you know who the statement is about. Hear me on this. When God told Moses, as he was preparing to go and rescue the people from Egypt, when God told Moses that from the point of their conversation forward, his people were to refer to him as Yahweh, God was making a statement to Moses, I am. And when the psalmist writes here in Psalm 126, when he writes and prays for God to give restoration just by using the personal name of God, the name Yahweh, he's essentially reminding himself that God is. And now you here may be wondering, like, okay, what's that mean? I don't, I don't understand how Hebrew works. Like, like, what significance does that bear for me? Why is that good news? That's just the point. God's name means he just is. He's always been, and he still is, always, all that he needs to be, church. And what better news is there for Christians who are in need of restoration in life? That God is. <laughs> he just is. Whatever he needs to be. Whenever you need him to be it, God just is. In his unchanging character, he is. In his ever consistent person, he is. So if he used to be the God of restoration, he still is, and he will always be the God of restoration. And this enables you to pray, church, imperative prayers of expectation that the God who restores will one day restore again. And so the psalmist prays, restore our fortunes, Lord like water courses in the Negev. The Negev that the psalmist mentions was a nearby desert that was known for having uh, these dry, uh, uh, destitute, dusty, crusty grounds. And it had these hollowed out riverbeds since all the water had dried up. But whenever it would rain, the water courses or the riverbeds would be flooded with water and hydration. The soil was so dry that the rain didn't actually seep into the riverbeds. It would just kind of pool and flood into them. So in in an instant, You'd have rivers restored to what rivers used to be. And the psalmist, from his current place of suffering, cries out, and he asks God to restore their fortunes in a way that he restore those rivers with rain. I want to point out to us the contrasting pictures we get from that in verse 4 and what we see down in verse 6. The picture in verse 4 is a picture of instant restoration. The psalmist is saying, God, we request that you restore our fortunes now. But the picture we get in verses 5 through 6 is a picture of restoration that takes time. It's a picture of those who sow in tears, reaping with shouts of joy. Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy, it says. The one goes along weeping, carrying the bag of seed. He will surely come back with shouts of joy, carrying his sheaves. It's a picture of one who sows and then has to wait for a harvest to come in order to see God's restoration. It isn't a picture of instant, quick restoration like we see with the the Negev water courses. And I think the implication here, church, is that whether God gives the restoration we need quickly or over the course of time, he sees us, he hears our cries, and our tears are never wasted. There is no guarantee that crying out to God will yield immediate relief of burden or pain in his earthly life. But there is a guarantee that God takes note of your tears and he intends to bring fruit from them. I love the word picture the psalmist uses here in verses five through six. Uh, These were an agricultural people. And so he uses this agricultural picture to depict that our tears are purposeful when we cry out in this life. They aren't wasted tears. Psalm 56, eight tells us that God stores our tears in a bottle and Psalm 126 is essentially making the point that Psalm 56 is telling the truth. God takes close notes and he designates purpose for the tears of his people. I think that's important because we so often talk about how weeping comes before joy, and how pain precedes triumph in Christ. And that's all good and true. But friends, the language of this psalm, it takes it even a step further to make the point that weeping not only precedes joy, but weeping for God's people actually produces a harvest of future joy. I'm not going to pretend to know how it all works, but what I will say is this. For God's people, your tears are contributions to the joy you'll eventually reap. God uses your tears, church. It's like 2 Corinthians 4.17 tells us, our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. And so when you cry out to God, Christian, know that you're crying out not only to a God who sees your tears, not only to a God who intends to one day wipe your tears, but friend, cry out knowing that you have a God who right now is using your tears to grow something for you. You may get to see it in this life, and you will certainly get to see it in the next. Restoration is yours in Christ, beloved. 
Joy is not lost due to suffering. Joy is not even deferred due to your suffering. When you suffer in Christ, beloved, future joy can be multiplied because of your suffering. Restoration is to come for God's people. I told y'all last week that I'm not sure why God has allowed us as a church to suffer so much as a church in our first three years together. But I said that I was sure he loves us. I want to add to that this week. I'm not sure why God has allowed our church to suffer so much in these three years, but I'm sure that he love us, loves us, and I'm sure that our suffering is producing a great harvest for us to one day reap. I don't know what all it'll be. I don't know when it'll be. But in a strange kind of way, Pioneer Church, I'm glad that I'm getting to be a part of it. There is restoration to come. We sow in weeping now, but one day we'll reap with shouts of joy. And this truth about our suffering today, it points to the same truth that's at the very center of our faith. Christ Jesus was both the model and manifestation of sorrows producing joy. He modeled it because he came to earth, being called the man of sorrows. He came knowing that he was to endure the world's greatest sorrow. And Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that he did it for the joy that was set before him. He knew that there would be the restoration of joy to be produced by his suffering and sorrows. And then he manifested that very thing. The death of Christ, friends, was the epitome of an occasion worthy of weeping. Oh, but the resurrection of Christ was the epitome of an occasion that brought restored joy. And catch this, without the death, there would have been no resurrection. And so there would be no salvation. Friends, it is the sorrowful, weak-worthy death of Christ that has produced the shout-worthy, resurrection-secured, salvation-tethered, eternally restored joy of the world. Christ was a son lost in order to become a savior gained, and there is no greater example of weeping coming, weeping producing for us a greater joy. I told y'all a few weeks ago about how I love the Psalms of Ascent. Uh, they're unique psalms that were saying during unique times of God taking his people and, and leading them on a journey toward Jerusalem. They would be trekking toward Jerusalem, climbing Mount Zion into Jerusalem so they could join in the festivals of worship unto God. And these unique songs provide unique perspective about a life lived in worship unto God. Because when you consider how the context of, of the songs must have influenced the content of these songs, you can actually see with your mind's eye how the people of God carried on journey after journey to Jerusalem, festival after festival, year after year, whenever they were free to go and do it, they made their journey to Jerusalem time after time in spite of what the circumstances of life was like at the time. And Psalm 26 is one of those songs of ascent. And as you can tell from the context of this song, friends, the content revolves around people who are worshiping on their way to worship in spite of circumstances being hard. Psalms like this are written when the people of God allow for lament to be lessons in their worship of him. And I pray to God that our church is doing the same thing in this season. I pray that we maintain the lessons of our sufferings and, 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 and keep these lessons that our sufferings are teaching us. I pray that we remember to trust God in his faithfulness. I pray that we remember to always be intentional in caring for one another, to share one another's burdens and, and to share one another's joys. I pray that we're learning more about how to, to feel our relationships with God. One of the worries I have for my generation is that we do so much thinking about God that we often think ourselves out of feeling what the truth about God that we know is supposed to make us feel. We can be so head dominant that we become heart negligent. But one of the things that may have been a benefit to us as a church because of all our suffering is that we might have learned some things about feeling God's truth. Suffering teaches us, friends, that truth about God is for more than our heads, but it's also for our hearts. Suffering teaches us, friends, that when we run out of words and thoughts about God, we can offer our tears to make an appeal for God's goodness. And I pray, church, that we maintain these lessons for the good of our church and the good of this generation. So may we continue singing our songs of ascent. May we continue along this journey, beloved, in the same way that God provided those of this song with strength for their worship to continue, even when the joys that they once known in life did not continue. May we find as a church that this strength is also provided for us. As we continue on our journey of worshiping the Lord, when we're remembering the restoration of yesterday and awaiting the restorations of tomorrow, may the Lord provide strength for us along the journey. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. 
for it being one of the very conduits of strength that we as your people can find. God, I pray for any heart and mind in the room that is in need of strength this morning. Would you be gracious to provide it? Would you be gracious to give endurance, steadfastness and faith, hope, joy, memories that fuel hope and joy? God, would you be gracious to give joy and salvation amidst a world that so starkly contrasts the gospel that we've been saved by? We thank you that Christ has made this possible, that we can come to you asking for this in his name, trusting that you hear us, trusting that the tears we cry, the sighs that we let out, they're not lost on you, God. We trust that you're using them to produce a harvest in the here and now and in the heaven that we anticipate joining you in. So thank you, Father, for using our tears. Sustain us as we cry them and give us hope as we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.